So my name is Jared Palmer. I work at the Palmer Group uh, with my, my buddy Ian there, Ian White. He uh, wrote a lot of the code that you're about to see later today. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, at Jared Palmer on Twitter. About 2014 or so, I was building an Android app. Uh, I ultimately sold to a, uh, a large packaged goods company. And soon after that, I basically got into React almost full time and I've been building React applications for, you know, since then almost every single day. And so the topic of the, the of what I want to show you today is um, forms. So I want to share, we'll talk a lot about forms. Forms kind of suck, right? Like who likes, who likes writing forms here? Literally no one, right? How many forms, how many people in this room wrote a form with React today? Today, today, like actually today. How long did it take you? Probably the longest part of your day was writing that component. Just like, uh, it's the worst. So today I want to talk to you about a library that I wrote that's going to hopefully help you with all of that. But first we have to think about, well, what's hard about forms? Forms are hard. Why are they hard? They're hard for a couple reasons. React doesn't do much for you. React is really great at a lot of things, but one of the things that's just mediocre at our forms. So what do you, what do, you do? Validation, tracking changes, just staying organized. There's so much spaghetti code surrounding forms because React really doesn't do too much for you at all. And of course, not bashing your face into your keyboard. So we've all seen this, hope, maybe a few of us out there. This is how the docs say to deal with two-way data binding. You use a change handler or callback and for one input, you can use one callback handler, and you just set state and call that, and you pass that to its on change on the input, and that works fine. But then you have multiple inputs because very rarely do we have forms with just a single input. And the trick that React in the React docs they say is to use this ES6 computed property, and that's this part that says event.target.name up there. And that basically allows you to take the name attribute of the input and use that as the key to tell you which state, which part of this, uh, the component state you're going to update. So that all makes sense? Have we seen this, some of this before? Okay. Then the React docs stop and you're sort of left to, your, you, you're on your own. How else do you deal with things like validation, tracking changes, handling your submissions? So what do you do? You go to GitHub and you look up React form helper because I need to do, you know, whatever. You see, I'll form it now as number two, but let's not get into that. Um, and, and so this is, this is challenging. So at the Palmer Group, uh, and Ian and I have been writing two large applications. One of them has about, I don't know, 40 or 50 forms in it. And just going willy-nilly and freewheeling is not a viable solution. There are a lot of benefits to staying organized. Uh, and one of the ways in do, uh, doing that is sort of evolved was to first find some sort of helper library to help us validate fields. That was step one. And step two was to organize our forms in a way that allowed us to build better primitives that we could share. So forming. So this sort of bore out of the idea again, we have sort of 30 to 50 forms need to stay organized and, and consistent around. And we wanted to build out a library that allowed us to uh, sort of think a little bit uh, about, sh share, share a ton of components between our forms. So how does it work? So form is a higher order component. And what that means is it's a component that returns, or a function that returns a component. It works a lot like Redux's Connect or Apollo's GraphQL. You pass it a configuration and it injects properties into your form. And it does all the heavy lifting in the sense that it handle, it tracks what your form's uh, values are, what, what fields have been visited, what the current errors are, is the form being submitted, and a wildcard status which you can deal with yourself and use for various things. So that's basically the way forms um, in Formic are, are stored. And the trick is, it's basically that 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 same trick that we just sh that I showed you before about the ES6 computed prop using that name attribute, right? And that's telling usually for those of you who probably wrote your form today was deciding which key was go was going to update for that change handler. But in Formic, that key's used for other things too. In fact, it's used exactly for these other things. Values, touched, and errors all have the same keys. 
And that's really useful, as it turns out, when you're building primitives. So this is what internally formix handle change um, kind of looks like. And just as a mental model, what we're doing is it's just basically spreading uh, the existing values. And if you ever seen this version of set state, uh, this is the updater pattern. And that allows us to optimize, this for, um, optimize formix uh, performance uh, using a pure function. No, sorry, pure component. So what does Formic really do for you then? So after you wrap up your inner form, you get some stuff for free. You get all the stuff I just showed you, and you basically end up in the same place you started, but if you're just doing it without Formic, but you get some other stuff for free. You get the same handle change, handle blur, handle submit, which is probably the way you would have named your handlers anyway. But then you also get some really nice uh, helpers to do things um, that are not just run-of-the-mill and identical to integrate with third-party components maybe, which we're going to show you in a second, uh, maybe, and, and have full control over that. And those are the field setters. And those are called set field value, set touch, and uh, set field error. So let's just jump into a demo because I think that it'd probably clear things up even more. So for, let's say you have a form, let's just build a form here and walk through the docs. So you have some user data from your API, you request that, and the problem is your user is not a flat React object. It's a, sorry, not a flat JavaScript object, and normally what you end up doing is flattening it out, and maybe you need to pass that user to your form uh, so you can edit, edit the user, and maybe it's in a dialogue. So that's a, this is what our ultimate shape would look like of the form once it's all done and wrapped up and all pretty. So enter Formic. So again, it's a higher order component, so we're gonna write the inside of it first. So let's make an edit user form. And I can destructure because I'm gonna get my values, touched, errors, dirty, submitting, and my cha handle change function all for free. And after that, it's not that magical. In fact, the whole point of Formic is that because it's basically the way you would write the form anyway, you can pretty much keep your existing code as is and then start building primitives on top of that uh, to create more powerful and more powerful abstractions. So I pass my handle submit um, function to on submit. I pass my handle change to on change and handle blur to on blur. And then for my values field of each one of my inputs, uh, all of them are keyed in the same place. They're all keyed in object uh, called values, which I can just pass to, my, to each value, course, each corresponding value. After that, it's very straightforward. You just, ever, since the keys of errors and touched match perfectly, I know that errors.email and touch.email are all related to the email field. So how do I wire this all up? So you import the formic function and you wrap your form. So you, one of the things you can do is, if you need to take props and map them around, remember that user object was not perfectly flat, one of the tricks you can do is destructure that or, or, or and transform that with a function called map props to values. The other thing that formic does for you that it was a pretty big design decision was that it integrates with a library called Yup. And Yup, who here has heard of Joy for, the, for, for Node? If you've done happy work or anything, no? Okay, Joy. Joy's pretty cool. Joy is a, a, a validation library for uh, JavaScript objects that's very popular in the HappyJS Node framework. It uses a builder syntax, which kind of looks like prop types for those who haven't played with it. Uh, and basically what that lets you do is you define your form sort of shape from a validation perspective just in a you know, very uh, similar syntax to prop types. And you just pass that in as a schema. And you can also uh, add custom error messages. The other part of Formic, as I mentioned before, it helps you stay organized. And one of the ways it does that is by co-locating your submission handle. And so you just write your handle submit function right there in the form. It's not in the uh, like component above it, it's just right there in the same file. And that's immensely useful as the number of your forms start expanding and especially as your forms become more and more specialized uh, depending uh, on how you use them. So here's an example submission handler here. I'm gonna call my API, maybe I passed in, just take the user, the ID out of the user, and then Formic gives me some helpers to, to set submitting and set errors so I can again toggle and uh, switch out states uh, within my sub after, after the form has been submitted. So what's this look like in reality? Can you all see this? Yeah, cool. So here's a really basic demo of Formic. Uh, at the bottom here I've shown, I've just printed out the props that are gonna get injected into the component for free after you wrap it with Formic. So as I type, 
I see that the values.email is, has changed. But as soon as I blur or deselect the field, now Formic has mirrored the same key over to errors and touched. So what's that look like? Same thing as before. I am gonna wrap my form with uh, the Formic function. I can map props to some initial values. In this situation, I actually didn't use yup. I used a custom validation function that I wrote just for this form. Uh, just in case you don't like yup, you, can you don't have to use it, you're not forced to. And I, and I co-located my submission handler. So let's fix this form. Validation worked. It says uh, the form is dirty, uh, it tracked that the, the email field's been visited, and I press submit, and we're good. So that's, that's the basic form with Formic. So now let's start building some primitives. Similar setup, uh, our app is just gonna be sign up for a newsletter and our enhanced form. So the, start with the inner part of the form first. Very similar thing as before, we're gonna destructure uh, the, the injected props, pull out the stuff that we'd normally use, like handle change, handle blur, and values, and touch and start passing into some inputs. But instead of just uh, regular HTML input, DOM inputs, we've built an input component that can be reused. So what's that look like? So that text input is just taking some props in and it's gonna do some fun stuff. Who's played with class names before from Jed Watson? Class names is really nice for dealing with some logic related to classes. Anyway, it helps power up some, some, some animations in this uh, version, but basically all this text input component's gonna do is it's gonna add a label and it's gonna print a text input and spreads props and account for our feedback. So we can wire these up and if I try to deal with this, that looks good. Well, no one's name looks like that, right? Oh no, it's not an email. So again, you can start building these primitive components out very quickly and sharing them across your application. As your application grows, having strong form prim primitives will speed up, speed up your entire team. You will save hours and hours if you build up the right primitives at first, and making the wrong primitives can really cost you because having to, oh, maybe part of my app is Redux form components compliant, or it's something else, or this person called it a different thing than handle change. It just, it just increases the amount of overhead uh, and, and developer um, sort of, uh, increase the amount of um, time it takes to just grep a given form uh, really can slow you down. So let's do a more involved example here. So this is an edit post, <laughs> and uh, this, uh, this, this, this is gonna show you the power of why we chose to use map props to values. So that, this form is gonna get seeded with, uh, pre-populated with some data. And that data is related to Ken Wheeler. Um, so just component mount, we're gonna set some state, and this is post. Then we're gonna pass that post once it's loaded to our form so it can be edited. So my form again, we're gonna wrap a form component up. And from there, we're gonna use that same text input component again, a new one called text area. In this case, I'm gonna show you how, we, how, it's easy, how easy it is to integrate with a third party library. In this form, we're gonna use React Select. And so you can see over here, topics about this post is being fabulous in recent ML. And this is a really popular library if you've ever used select inputs, use React Select, it's awesome. But there's two, those, there are two extra functions that are new in this, in this case, and that's set field value and set touch. And those allow you to have full control over exactly uh, which part of the uh, of, of values is gonna get um, changed in relation to an event. And so when you need to integrate with a custom input, you don't, you, you don't have to reuse that same exact handle change function, you have total control. And so let's just jump in to look at what a custom uh, version of React Select looks like with Formic. So I need to, I, I use a class, so I need to override the defaults, uh, handle change and handle blur. And all I'm doing here is I took uh, the set field value and I take the name and the key, or the ID number, the ID of the, uh, of what's passed in, and I'm basically gonna call set field uh, value, which has been renamed on change in the situation. Uh, and set it to its new value, which I get exactly from 
the React selects uh, on change function. Oh, sorry, on, on change property. And so just with that linking and using set field value and set field touched, you basically can integrate with any third party component. And what I mean by that, uh, and this, with the, using the exact same method. So after we've edited this, you'll see that everything's updating properly. Um, oh, it says pick at least three tags. Again, all of this was done with Yup, so it's relatively straightforward to write pretty complex validations very quickly. So for that one, I called the Yup array. I wanted it to be a min lane three, and was able to just inline my message right there. Again, it's a lot like prop types. So I want to boost this post. So this is another component integrated. Uh, it's from Airbnb. It's called Reostat. It's a Reostat. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But it is a uh, slider component that's on Airbnb.com, and you can just slide it up and down like that. But that state gets tracked in Formic down here in the price part. And so, unremarkable, yes, indeed. But what's remarkable about this is that this, these, these components, once you start building them, uh, the, the true power of Formic is its organization. And that by staying really organized and by staying and keeping all of your change handlers identically named, and then using the same exact interface to integrate with third-party form components, you've removed a lot of uh, the human error or, uh, or just differences in the way that uh, conventions, so to speak, uh, across developer to developer. And that is incredibly important as you scale your application. And then when you couple something with Formic with TypeScript like we do, uh, it gets even more powerful um, as it relates to type validation too. And so with that, um, I'd, I'd like to sort of show you maybe, uh, if we have, how much time do we have? Five minutes, all right, cool. So Formic is, at the moment is, uh, again, a higher order component. What's awesome about it versus what else is out there. So Formic is 2.3 kilobytes, it's tiny. Redux form is the, I think, 22.5 kilobytes, and uh, every byte matters. And the other thing is that, for the life of me, I can't understand, I'm not a big proponent of putting form state in Redux. Forms are inherently local concepts. They, have, they don't need to be shared globally with your, the rest of your application. You might need to put something that gets called globally, like if you need to update the result of the form, but the form itself, the actual inputs themselves, just don't belong in Redux. There's no reason to put them there. And so um, one of the reasons that uh, Formic is so much faster than, than, than Redux form too is because it doesn't use Redux, it also doesn't use context. Uh, and so, I don't need to get into benchmarks, but there, there are some performance gains too with using, uh, without using context or non-context based solutions. So right now with, with Formic, there is a little bit of um, ceremony. Let's just put it that way. There's, you gotta, you gotta wire up this higher, higher, higher order component. You gotta, you gotta configure stuff. And that's cool, but as sort of we've seen, uh, I think also as we'll probably hear from Ryan, there's been a large move in the React community towards keeping things sort of in React in the component model. And we have been experimenting with uh, that in Formic. And so today I wanna to show you guys a preview of what's coming in Formic uh, in the next release. And with that, um, there is some um, slight changes. So in the next version of Formic, no more power order component isn't required. Uh, instead we move to a render prop. And what that means is you can define your entire form in line without having to do much else. Much like you would define a route in React Router using that same sort of render function, you can again define your entire form that way. So API is a little different. There's uh, over here you have get initial values instead of map props to values. You pass the same validation schema, it works exactly the same way. Everything that was a configuration is now just can be passed in as a prop to a new um, component called Formic. In addition, there's another little helper called field, and this actually does use context. Uh, but what the nice benefit of this is you don't need to complete, you don't need to keep repeating yourself uh, over and over and over again when you want to uh, wire up uh, handle change, handle blur, uh, and values. It just knows, and that's pretty cool. It actually works a lot like Redux form in the sense uh, from an API perspective, where you can pass in custom inputs uh, into, uh, or, um, into a component prop. But after that, you want to wire up a field for uh, first name. You just pass and you just drop first name, and again, it works. Everything works on the on the uh, name key. So let's add another field here. Let's call this I don't know middle name. And 
that just works and wires up, and it wires up um, all over to Formic. Let's give it an initial value here. And there it is, and you're all wired up. So there's just like a lot less ceremony to all of this. And again, just like React Router, there's just a render function in this, in this big form component. It also accepts components. We actually took that part of the uh, API from React Router, so it works a very similar way. Uh, and with this, there's just gonna be a lot less ceremony. You'll just be writing forms faster, and that's ultimately what the whole point of Formic is about. Is about. It's just for writing things faster and taking a lot of the pain out of forms, which are inherently painful because they you know, don't go against the they go against the React one-way data flow. They have two-way data binding. Uh, there is just not a great way to process validation, and so Formic's goal there, and especially with the next the new API, will be to streamline your workflow. So. With that, uh, I want to say thank you, and if you are, um, thank, thank you to Ilya, and thank you to Spotify. Uh, if you guys are awesome and you understood what I just said, come find me after. I'm working on a new startup, just secured some funding, and uh, look, definitely hiring, and uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. MBM, MBMI and so right? Thank you. Oh yeah, sorry, questions? Um, so, you know, back in the day we saw mix-ins and then we probably saw some other stuff and then we had HOCs and now we see more and more of these types of components. What's the benefit of this kind of render prop thing versus HOCs? So this good question. So the good question was what's the what's the sort of difference between HOCs and render props, right? Like what's the what's the benefit of a render prop? Yeah. So the render prop, which is this similar API through React Router or this was very popular, React Router 4 I should say is that you don't need, you just sort of stay in your React mindset and you don't need to wire something up outside of the component itself and you sort of drop it in anywhere. And so it seems like basically the same configuration, but if I take out all this gunk, it's more or less, let me just take this all out here, so you can see the whole component in like one thing. I mean, that's the whole form right there. Um, and so you just jump right into it and it just allows you to, it's just a component at that point. There's, instead of, with a with a higher order with a higher order component you, with and, and wrapping, um, I, you know there's just the, another sort of uh, line of thinking, the uh, recomposed line of thinking, right? Which is like let's use a ton of higher order components. And the thing is that React already React already has composition built into it, and so the render props mindset is let's just use React's composition model instead of breaking outside of that with higher order components. To, to be fair, um, the API, just the same way that uh, in Formic Next, well, the same way that uh, React Router has a with router uh, HOC, exactly the same way. Uh, there's a with Formic or Formic Factory, so it's going to be called probably. Other question? One more? Right, um, there was. Have you, uh, it sounded really interesting the stuff you're talking about, how this is much faster than running all these the Redux action for using context. Have you profiled that at all? Do you have like the stats about how much faster it is? So the question was how much faster is it? Uh, I asked this question uh, it, with uh, versus uh, wiring things up through Redux or not. Um, there's a performance penalty. It depends on your app and depends on your CSS for sure. Um, to the benchmarks that we've done uh, on the same exact form between Formic, not the next version, but the, the current version and Redux form, so the average like uh, latency is about six milliseconds uh, on a given keystroke, and Redux form is about sixteen. So just it is a pretty big performance hit, and that's with the same validation functions too. So depending on how you know that can get more and more extreme. Again, it's 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 important to profile your own application and test in your own CSS framework. But that being said, um, I believe I asked this question to Netflix engineer the other day on Twitter, and I was like, is there even a price? to pay for even hooking into context. And apparently there is actually a price for just hooking into context. It's very small and minute. Probably it's not gonna affect um, your bottom line, but there is a penalty. That being said, I'm pretty pumped about render props as it relates to just staying in the React model and using React composition instead of HOC. Uh, and so I think it's probably gonna be worth it, but wanna be able to support both to answer your question. So yes, there is one, yeah, sure. Awesome, thank you. Thank you guys.